Welcome to my presentation. Uh, I'm really happy to be with you guys, discover this great ecosystem. Uh, I want to thank uh, Lightband team for accepting this talk, especially Marcus. Uh, gives opportunity to other people who are working in the reactive software uh, industry to, to showcase uh, in, in this summit. So who we are? I bet most of you guys don't know who we are. We are Treadzone, small startup, a company based in Paris, as you can see from the motto, Elegance. Uh, it sells very, very well. And uh, we, wh why we exist, actually? We exist because of as a need of designing high-performance software with low latency and deterministic, deterministic performance, especially for mission-critical, latency-sensitive applications. So the target market that we designed this, this piece of technology is actually was for capital markets and trading uh, infrastructures. And we discovered, after we developed this technology, that it's the API, actually, is we, we are doing the actor model. So we, were, we even didn't know that exists the actor model back then. So we have reinvented the wheel, doing the actor model, multi-core optimized. And what we are showing today in this presentation is actually our blueprints on how we designed a, a full trading uh, system based on our actor model, runtime and principles. So the title of the talk is Reactive Design Patterns for Microservices on Multicore. So the talk is composed of three parts. The first one are the issues that uh, we, we, we can encounter when we have multicore multi issues on microservices, how they impact the performance of microservices. Then second part, are I will show seven reactive patterns that tackle these issues. And finally, I will share my vision on uh, what's the best software roadmap. And it, it, it really summarizes what we have seen so far from the keynotes about software engineering principles. And uh, so I, I will keep it to the end. So first, microservice on multicore. This is a typical modern microservice architecture. By saying modern, it means that we have several microservices in the architecture where each microservice is built using the actor model principle. So we have from bottom up, the, we, are, we, are, we are designing a distributed system based on messaging and asynchronous components. And this, uh, of course, to run the system, we need an efficient runtime run to handle the messaging between different components. So we have components communicating inside each service, and then we have communication going on between the services. So far, so good. But when we look at the profile of the performance of each microservice, it will lie something here in this spectrum. So it's, it's a ratio between two components, two main components, computation and communication. So if we have more computation than communication, we are in what we call batch processing. And as far as we move down in the spectrum, we have more communication than computation, we are in the area we call it highly interconnected workflows. Okay, so it's actually the area of fast data. So how does this impact the architecture? So by having fast data architectures, we have more interactions between the different actors of the system. We, can, we, we have interactions that are even dynamic. We don't know in advance who will communicate with whom. So, and we'll have more interaction, not only new, but more interactions. This means that we'll have some passes in, in the system where we have high frequency ac communication activities between the components and other passes in the system where it's low frequency. Again, it's the runtime who should handle these challenges, how to guarantee that the performance is from end to end satisfied by design. You know, it's deterministic. So this is quite challenging. Then we have multi-core. So we're starting building up. We have multi-core. Multi-core is uh, since uh, 2006, we have the dual-core machine. And people are starting aware 
since la like last four years that multi-core is really a, an issue in performance because software, we, what we expected from Moore's law, which is, by the way, an economical law. It's not a technological law. It's an economical law. I mean by this that we, we buy a new machine every two years, and we expect it, it's at the same cost, and we should double the performance. If it's not at the same cost, then it's not, uh, nobody will buy a new machine. So the current technology, actually, we have, uh, the current state of the art, we have around 24 cores per CPU socket. This is the latest uh, uh, chips we can get from Intel, and we can have up to eight sockets per machine. So eight times 24, we do the math. We have a lot of multi-core, a uh, lot of cores in the architecture. And the roadmap from ITRS, which is International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductor, is it's expecting that it will double every two years. So 2020, be prepared for 48 cores per CPU socket. So basically, if we have more cores per machine, this means that our microservice that was designed like six years ago, which, which mapped before one microservice is equal to one machine, now we'll have more microservice per machine. It's obligatory. We, we should have more microservice per machine. And this will, what, what, what means, it means that we will share resources between the different microservices. So if we take this architecture, which is just two microservices, we can have cores that are running from different services, or, uh, sorry, actors running on different cores from different services. And it is the case if we don't control where our microservice will run and we rely on, on, on run times and middlewares that, that does this, the different type of scheduling. So this is problematic, and I will show you why this is problematic. As I said, Moore's law is, is an economical law. We expect to scale double performance each time. We, we, we double the course. So this means perfect scalability. So a perfect scalable system, I don't know if uh, you have any use cases where, where, where it exists, but uh, from my experience, we never saw a perfect scalable system when we add more cores. Why is this? Because of Gunther Law, which, which he, he really explained what's the uh, universal law of scalability of a system. It's uh, actually, we can model it very easily with uh, what you call the performance system with the queuing theory. And uh, this equation states that there are two main parameters that makes our system not perfectly scalable. It's contention and coherency. By contention, I mean we have multiple resources, like components, like actors, sharing the same physical resource. This is contention. Threads sharing the same core. This is contention. And I will show it later. So if we have contention, we, have, uh, uh, we, we don't have a scalable system. We, have a, uh, we don't have a scalable system. And if we add coherency plus contention, we have a negatively scalable system. So, this means that we have like a turning point. At some point, we have four cores or eight cores. After this number, we can start to see performance degradation where our performance is really uh, scale, uh, scales negatively. So we, based on this analysis, uh, we want to see what are the sources of, the main source of contention and coherency in uh, multi-core architecture. So let's take this example from Previously, we have these actors that want to communicate with each other based on the workflow we designed, uh, our actor systems. If, if we take the simple case where each actor is equal to one thread, we'll have something like this. This is spaghetti. So if, if we designed our system, uh, we don't take into account multi-threading, we'll have a, a communication going from uh, in, in a spaghetti mode, and, and what this means is that if you have multiple threads per core, this will add more context switching from the operating system because it should guarantee fairness, and hence we don't control anymore the determinism of the performance. So what we would like to have is something like this. Instead of inter-thread communication, we want to go and do a system, we need a system where we do inter-core communication, not inter-thread. This is the physical, this is the hardware.
So this is one example of contention. Coherency, so we have intercore communication. This is a typical multi-core architecture where we have, uh, I don't know how, if people are familiar with this type of uh, diagram. Okay, so I, I will go fast on this one. So this is a typical multi-core architecture. We can find in Skylake architecture and uh, Broadwell architecture. So we have cores that are doing the processing and then we have a cache memory uh, architecture. So if the core access data in his register, it's called one cycle. So if we have a frequency operate, operating frequency of three gigahertz, it's 0 0.3 nanosecond. Then we have per core a private, L, uh, private cache memory. It's composed of L1 cache and L2 cache. Again, data should be very close to CPU in order to be performant, but if data does not fit in L1 cache, it's 32 kilobytes. Uh, it, we have a cache mess, it goes to the L2 cache, it's around 256 kilobytes for older generations. New Skylakes are one megabyte, but they reduce the L3 cache, and it will cost around 12 cycles. But here we are still deterministic in this area because it's only private to each core. But what about core-to-core -core synchronization? When we want to, to, to send data from one core to, to the other, actually it, it passes by the shared L3 cache or less level cache. And here we are in a non-deterministic uh, zone. So if everything goes right, we are at about 30 cycles. But to do the cache coherency, what we call cache coherency, it's actually when the data in core one is uh, equ equivalent to the uh, data that he wants to read in core two, okay, there is a whole uh, a cache uh, thrashing and copying the data from uh, L1 cache to L3 cache to the L1 cache of the other core, and this is done automatically by hardware. You don't control it by software. It's called the MESI protocol, and it costs around 200 nanoseconds. So each thread-to-thread -thread synchronization is at least 200 nanoseconds. If we have multiple cache line we are using, so a big data where we are synchronizing instead of a small byte, it will cost much more, as we will see later. So this is an example of coherency, why it can impact scalability. And we add business requirements. So uh, in, in our case, in capital market, uh, we are ask, asking us to, to have design software that treats millions that can process millions of messages per second at several microseconds, tens, 50, 100 microseconds. And to make things funnier or nightmare, uh, we want stability and determinism of performance. So 50% yield, which means the average uh, uh, latency, it's not acceptable. We need systems with 90% yield, 99% yield, uh, deterministic. So we looked at uh, technologies we have uh, uh, in the literature, we, and we did, we did not find something that satisfy our need, and we designed our own technology. So our own technology is actually a multi-core optimized runtime following this design principle. The first one, one thread per core. Basta. We don't have more. So in this way, we eliminate context, switch, context switching. So if we change from operating system to the other, it's always the same performance. We don't have a, a scheduler overhead. Second principle, we share actors, multiple actors per thread. So one actor per thread is not sufficient for high core utilization, so we need multiple actors uh, per thread. And the third principle, we have an event loop that a schedule that runs infinitely, this event loop, and it schedules the actors, and whenever an actor has an event, it, it executes directly its, its callbacks or it, its, its function. And the way they are linked with each other, all event loops are completely distributed, okay? We don't have centralized uh, computation. Each one lives its, its own life, and they are connected with each other, so with other event loops, uh, using a unidirectional communication channel, okay? And the way it happens is that at each event loop, we, we, we check if we have events. At the end of the event loop, we check if we have events coming from the other core. So we have like one cache coherency, always. So if we have multiple actors sending messages to other cores, we only synchronize once. 
We don't synchronize as much as we have uh, messages sending from actors uh, from course to course. So at, at idle time, an event loop actually is costs around 300 nanoseconds depending on the machine. So if we don't have any messages running, it's 300 nanoseconds. Following this design principle, uh, we have some constraints on how we, design, how, how we write actors. First of all, if you have one thread per core, it means actors should be monothreaded, always. This is the first design principle. And since uh, actors are sharing the same thread, actors should be non-blocking. If they are blocking, they will block the whole thread. So we should be, uh, be careful on, on, on these uh, two parts. And yeah, well, forget to tell you that the communication between threads is completely lock-free. We don't rely on mechanism of, uh, uh, from P-thread, for example. So, yes, it's possible. Actually, multi-threaded programming is, uh, is a solution that was uh, developed for, uh, to increase the utilization of one core. And when we, got, we have multi-cores, people use multi-threading to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to develop on multi-cores, but it's not an adapted solution for multi-cores. So now we get back to systems, and as I saw previously in previous presentation, systems of running on one thread per core, and they can be very, very efficient in terms of utilization of core and uh, cache friendly. So uh, following these two design principles, these uh, design principle, principles of simplex, and by the way, simplex is uh, it's the way the, the cores are connected to each other. It's a simplex uh, graph. So we have always peer-to-peer -peer, pair, pair connection between cores. So following these design principles, we need to, to see what type of design patterns we, sh we can adapt uh, and we can execute uh, on simplex. And the literature is uh, very rich on this one. We have two great books. I have them on my desk. There are great resources for designing actor models but when we come to uh, low-level optimizations, uh, we don't have any patterns that uh, solving uh, real case problems. So uh, that's why I will show you in the next part the patterns that we used in, in, uh, in Trezor. So before starting this next part, I, I, I will give you three million microseconds uh, to test your reactivity to find Waldo or Wally or Charlie. Depends on where you come from. Okay? One million, two million, three million. Thank you. Goes fast, my three million microsecond. Anyone, anybody find it? Yes? There is one yes? Great. So I will put it back at the end of the presentation. So this is actually to tell you that there is no good choice or bad choice on patterns. What we saw here, we saw the same pattern repeating uh, several times, but uh, it depends on your context and the way, uh, actually on your software also, and the frameworks you use, one, they approach reality more than others. So I will discuss about it at the end. So what are the categories I will discuss over here? Uh, the first category is core-to-core -core messaging patterns. So we have seven patterns in total I will show. We have much more, but uh, for the case of uh, this presentation, I will only focus on these seven. So the first uh, category is core-to-core -core messaging. How we deal with core-to-core -core communication. Core monitoring, core-to-core -core flow control, and core-to-cache management. We have more patterns, for example, related to core-to-IO, like core-to-network, core-to-database. Uh, also related to clustering, but I will not discuss it uh, today. Maybe in next year. So let's start with the first one, core-to-core -core messaging. So uh, my colleague today in, in the keynote, he talked about transparent elasticity. So in transparent elasticity, we have the notion of uh, it's actually an actor, a sender actor will push a message to another actor. This is how we do it in Trezor push a message. But depending on the location of uh, the second, uh, the, the receiver actor, which is green here, uh, the latency is not the same. So if we are on another server machine, it can take between one microsecond and 10 microseconds, depending on if we are using kernel bypass or not, we're using fast uh, network cards or not. If we are on a core that is on another CPU socket on the same machine, 
it will take out approximately 500 nanoseconds because we should pass uh, a bigger cache uh, memory hierarchy and you should pass by QPI in, in, uh, in uh, Intel chips. So it takes around 500 nanoseconds. And if we are on two cores on the same uh, CPU socket, it takes around 300 nanoseconds, which is the cost of an event loop. But what if we have two actors communicating on the same core? Can we do better? So if we keep the same semantic, we are pushing a message, a message is asynchronous. Okay, so if we, a sender push a message to, to a receiver, he, uh, the receiver will read it in the next event loop. So it will take at least 300 nanoseconds to be read by the receiver. But for some workflows, like for example, we have a, an actor who wants to just to update a counter uh, located in another actor. Okay, this is a fast workflow that we don't want to wait 300 nanoseconds to, to be processed. It's an overkill. And we see it a lot in low latency trading applications, this type of uh, uh, workflows. So we want a better way to, to send this message. And in our case, we implemented what we call direct call mechanism, which actually we, we call directly the function uh, that, is, uh, that does the operation in, in the green actor, instead of pushing a message, putting it on the queue, and then be called back on the event loop. It will cost two nanoseconds. It's a direct call of function, two nanoseconds. And this is completely transparent to the user. He can, he can, by design, develop actors that push a message and have direct call. And depending on the deployment, uh, we can choose, uh, it, 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 automatically you can choose the best uh, uh, function call. So, but bear in mind, this is a synchronous call. It's not asynchronous. So it should be used with moderation. It's not adapted to all workflows. So this pattern is called the core aware messaging pattern. And we have around 150 times a speed up. The second pattern called message mutualization pattern. People who works with uh, network, uh, network programming, they, it's, they are very familiar to this type of pattern. So we have a sender that wants to communicate the same data, the same message to three receivers located on the same core. If you want to do it in uncontrolled way, we send, we push the message three times, which, which means that we copy the data three times in the memory. So it's a cache coherency uh, that is three times bigger than uh, the actual data. We have only one copy of the data. So this is three events, as I said here. To solve uh, this issue, we, uh, our pattern actually, we implement uh, what we call a router, a local router per core, and the sender sends only one message to the local router, so it's one event, and then he, using the previous pattern, he can call, have a direct call directly to the uh, receiver actors. So in terms of cost, we reduce the number of events here, and here we have a two nanosecond direct call. It will not cost a lot. And we benchmark this solution. So how much we gain? with the pattern and without the pattern. On the x-axis, we increase the number of actors or receiver actors from two till 13. And on the y-axis, we show the overhead we have by using the pattern with, uh, with respect to not using the pattern. And the, on the yellow, uh, ax, uh, yellow line, it's actually, we have two cores on the same CPU socket, and the green line, two cores on different CPU socket. And here, we can see a, a very interesting uh, uh, performance gain. Uh, if we are on the same CPU socket, we are around 50% uh, linear improvement. And if we are on two different CPU sockets, we are more than 100% linear improvement. So this small detail, this small pattern allowed us, allows us to gain around 100%. So imagine a complex software with multiple uh, patterns uh, added up and aggregating, so we can see why we can get from system macro, at microsecond level to system at several millisecond level, just by having these type of problems. The next uh, category are core monitoring patterns at real time. It's very important. So the first one is called core statistics pattern. Imagine we have several 
uh, orders coming from clients, and we, they are processed by several actors on the system, which are in red here, and these actors are distributed on, on multiple cores. What we want to know from system perspective, how many orders I received per second on the overall architecture. So how we do it without impacting the latency? So in this case, we have two actors on first core, two actors on the second core. And what I'm showing here, it's actually how we do it with Simplex. It's very easy, actually. It's you developers, you control where to put the actors on the core. You, you pin the actors on the core, and they don't move during the uh, runtime. And we can imagine that this is a configuration file uh, that comes uh, uh, from another tool that, uh, that maps the actors on cores. So you have control, actually, where, where, where we are running the workflow. So we use a concept in, uh, in Treadzone called singleton, a core singleton actor. So you know, most of you know about singleton, but core singleton is actually one instance, one special actor, one instance per core. We don't have multiple instances per core. And this way, uh, we have a singleton on each core that holds the, uh, the, the counter to, uh, to monitor. So, when an actor receives an event, he just increments in direct call uh, plus plus count, so it takes one cycle to uh, increment it. And this counter will hold actually the number of messages received per core here, okay? And we don't have race condition because it's, remember, it's a single threaded event loop. We don't have race condition, so an increment, counter increment is done uh, different phases. And then every second, this singleton actor will send uh, the, 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 count, uh, the, the, the counter to another service located on another core that will do the aggregation. And, and this service will tell us how many orders per second I received without impacting at all the latency. Fourth pattern is core usage pattern. So, as I said, if you want to do, um, uh, we have one thread per core. So we have one thread per core that is running infinitely. If we check uh, Linux, uh, he will always tell us it's used for 100%. So this does not mean anything, right? But if you want to do health monitoring and check what is the real capacity of our system, uh, we, need to, uh, we need this pattern to, to know in real time what is the effective utilization of, of my course? So let's take for simplicity an example on that on each, uh, this is the number of event loops, and in one second we have around 20 loops that are running. In reality, we can have almost three million loops per second. So if the loops are idle, we have 0% core usage. And by idle, I mean there were no push events, no uh, received events, no work, so it's idle. So we have around 20 loops per second and 0% core usage. In other case, if we have at least three loops that are working and depending on the functions of, uh, of, the, uh, of the callbacks or of the actors, the duration can be different, okay? So it depends how many actors we, we fire, the, the duration is different. And in this case, for example, we have three working loops but that are taking 60% of core usage instead of uh, 0%. But it's not 100%. It means that there is also capacity to continue uh, using the core uh, uh, more. And how we do it technically? Uh, you know, technically, we rely on what we call performance counters. We have in Simplex uh, performance counters per event loop that gives information to, uh, to the developer uh, and he can use in real time. And this counter does not cost anything. They are just variables that are uh, incrementing. So one of these counters is called idle loop. So actually, it's a binary uh, counter. It's a zero or one, okay? So if the current event loop is idle, it, go, it, it gives a zero on this uh, iteration of event loop. If, it's, uh, if there is at least one event process, it's a one. So what we need to do is actually to, to have a special actor that monitor 
uh, one actor per core that monitors this uh, particular variable. And at the end, in order to calculate the effective core usage, is actually this formula, one minus the sum of idle loops times the cost of idle loops. So in our case here, it's 0 0.05 second, but in reality, it's 300 nanosecond divided by 100. So if, if we do the math, we have around 60, we have 60% core usage. And this information is very important if you want to do strategies like load balancing in real time between cores. So I will show you a demo that recap the four patterns we saw here in this example uh, in order to have an idea how much, uh, w what gain we can have by, by applying this pattern. So this demo is very easy demo. We have three market data streams that are generating market, uh, market data. Uh, uh, so it's like an exchange, actually, generating market data. And we have two actors doing algo, uh, algo processing. Uh, so they are checking, actually, they are doing arbitrage. So they are checking the price of the first venue and the second venue, and then they decide where to put the trade. Sorry, it's not 100% zoomed, but I think it will do the job. So technically, as I said, three market data, two algos, and we have a system of four cores, okay? So we have two type of uh, profiles we can have. We can have either low latency or high throughput, okay? Uh, it's chunked over here, but it's okay. So, by low latency, I mean the fastest way to execute this, uh, this application is to run it on a single core, okay? So let's see how, how it goes on a single core. Here we are uh, in incrementing the number of messages per second that we are injecting from the market data. And on a single core, we are monitoring, so we're using the, 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 uh, the pattern uh, of core usage, we are monitoring the effective utilization of the core. So as we are adding more and more messages, we are seeing here that the core utilization is incrementing. And in terms of latency, the end-to-end -end workflow, so from market data to the output of uh, the algo, it's 210 nanosecond. It's very fast. We don't have network in this case. It's just uh, cores communicating. So in, and here we see that we, we, are, we, we have around 90% of core usage, and then we can have a strategy of high throughput because we are limited in the number of messages we can treat on core. We have, we, we have we got maximum four million messages to treat per core. So we switch to a high throughput configuration where we put the market data actors on each one on a separate core, and we put the two algos here on the first core. So we lose in terms of latency because we have core-to-core -core communication. So we are around 1,500 nanosecond, 1 1.5 microsecond, but we gain into on throughput. So now we can process, uh, we can process around 20 million messages per second instead of previously uh, much less. And what I'm not showing here because uh, the, okay, now it's good. I'm showing the 99 percentile. Of, uh, of my latency. So you see, for, for example, for this case, 99% is 1.4 microsecond, and the average, the last second, is 1.2 microsecond. So it's very close, these, these numbers. So this is to show, actually, how, why when we are on one core, we can be very fast, because we use direct call, we, we, we are very optimized, and when we go to multi-core, uh, we, we do core-to-core -core synchronization, but very limited, it's only one synchronization per core, not as much as we have actors. The next category is core-to-core -core flow control. This is a, a, a topic that was discussed previously in the keynote, that reactive streams, actually, they handle the flow control in a way that a receiver will tell the sender when it's the best time to send the message. Okay, this, this works. But 
in our case, uh, this limits the performance. Why? Because we want actually the sender to go at the maximum speed he can, he can, uh, he can afford. Uh, and uh, in order to do, to do this, uh, if we go at maximum speed, we have problems of queuing, especially if the consumer, uh, it's an unbalanced workflow. So if the consumer is running slower than the producer, we have an un unbalanced workflow, and then we, we start queuing, and we start having messages in memory uh, that may crash the memory. And then if, if we detect this issue, we can implement one of these strategies. Either we continue to queue until we crash, or we stop the workflows. This is the circuit breaker patterns. Or we can merge data, or we can do throttling. So we have several strategies. But how to detect that we are queuing? This is very important. Uh, it, should, it should be in real time. It should not take a lot of uh, logic to be detected. So we, we implemented this in, in simplex, in the runtime. It's the runtime. It's the event loop that gives the information to the developer if the receiver has, uh, uh, has already read uh, the, the message from the previous event loop. This information is completely done in the runtime. So it's a lot, it's a, the concept here, we, 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 talk, uh, we say it's called batch ID. So when we have two cores communicating with each other, if the previous message was read by the, by the actor, red actor, on the other core, we increment the batch ID on the local event loop. If it was not read, because it takes more time here for any reason, actually the batch ID stays the same, it does not increment. So what does this mean for developers developing, uh, pushing messages to other actors? They can test synchronously if the batch ID has changed or not, if if it has changed, it means I can push again. I can go at maximum speed. If it did not change, then we can uh, implement the strategies that we want. We do throttling, we, we, we drop uh, data, uh, or we send the information to other actors who take the decision. Uh, everything, uh, this check is done synchronously. So uh, this is a very powerful pattern. We, we use it a lot in, in our system. Uh, and it, it, it lets uh, balancing the workflow be, uh, between the cores very, very easily. And how much we gain? For, uh, what, what does this mean in reality? So here I have an example where I have a market data that is updating the price continuously. So it's receiving the price of an, uh, of an instrument. And it wants to send the price to a receiver, which is another, another core. So. Technically, if, if I'm not doing uh, this uh, batch uh, ID uh, technique, uh, it means that I'm pushing always the meshes I'm received. I'm, I'm synchronous, actually, in my, in, my, uh, in my sequence of events. It means that if I receive the price of, like, 64, I will send the price 64 to the destination. He will reach 64, and it will decrease linearly. But what we don't know, if actually, if this core to core communication if there are queuing. And yes, indeed, there are queuing because when we, we, we do the batch ID uh, technique, so we check if the communication pipe is ready or not. And in this, in this example, we just want to, to send the last price, so we drop all the messages. If the, the other actor is ready on the other core, we send the last price. We drop all the other uh, prices that we received before. And here we see that it's not the same price we are, actually, we dropped a lot of price because the, the core the, on destination, he, he, he was doing more activities. He was not ready. And then we drop messages, and we send only the last price message. So it's not se uh, sequential. So in this case, actually, we would have problems at some point in the system. Uh, uh, here, we guarantee that there is no problem. This is the maximum speed we can get uh, uh, between cores. I go to now to the last category, core to cache management patterns. This is very important. So six pattern called the cache aware split pattern. I'm not very good with the names, so I just describe how it works. <laughs> Maybe we can find more sexier names later. So uh, the use case here, we have clients sending to the, the exchange orders. In financial industry, the, the de facto uh, protocol is the fixed protocol. So a fixed protocol 
takes actually works simply 200 bytes. It's composed of multiple tags. It's 200 bytes. And when the exchange process the, the message from the client, he will send back the same message with the tags updated. So this means the exchange, actually, from exchange level, he should uh, store the fixed message, the 200 bytes locally, and uh, do the processing, and then get back to, to uh, and send the information back to, uh, to, to, the, to the client. So if, if we have a 200 bytes per message, uh, our objective is to have the, to be deterministic. To be deterministic, as we remember, we should stay in the private cache. If we have a private cache of 206 kilobyte, the L2 cache, we can store maximum 1,300 messages, which means in this case open orders, uh, before starting to see performance deterioration. So this is good. If this is the objective of the exchange, it's good. But can we do better? Well, actually, in, in reality, the fixed message uh, from exchange perspective, uh, from order book perspective, we don't need the full text, the whole text. We need just a small chunk of text. So in our case, what we need to store actually is 32 bytes instead of 200 bytes. So is this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, issue, we, we can optimize, we can decouple the process, uh, reading the, by, uh, the, the message and processing the message, and we can decouple it by core also to be cache aware. So we have the first actor here that is reading the, the full fixed message, and we have the book actor that, uh, that will process the fixed message. So the first actor, he will split the message, he will store locally uh, the other part of, of the fixed message, and he will only send the 32 bytes to the other uh, actor, the other core. And then, this core, this actor does the processing and send it back to, to the order entry actor, which does message reconciliation and send it back to the, to the client. So with this technique, we can actually store 32 bytes instead of 200 bytes. So we can have 8,000 open orders uh, per core. So technically, we save six cores to do a deterministic performance for the client. Again, this is a very specific to, to, to our use case, but I think in any use case, if we can think of, uh, of uh, this technique, uh, depending on, on, uh, on your use case, uh, we can gain a lo lot, uh, lot of memory, and we should pay attention to memory. Finally, the last pattern, pattern seven, is cache-friendly actor directory pattern. So if I take the previous example, uh, as I said, I have several book actors uh, running on different cores, uh, one problem, classical problem, what is the address of the destination actor? I have several book actors distributed on several cores. I need to know their, their address, their actor ID. So we have a router that we ask the router what's the address, and then it gives us the address, and we can send, push the message to the right book actor. So this means we have a map. Okay, in that router we have a map. So if we have uh, actors on several cores, the map is function of the incoming key of the message, okay? So in our case, uh, I'll show it, it's 12 bytes, and the address of the destination actor. So what's the address of destination actor? As we said before, it uh, should be, uh, uh, we have location transparency. So the address is actually a function of the actor ID of if we are on the same core, we add the core ID, we add the engine ID if we have multi a cluster uh, uh, configuration, and we add machine ID. So if, for case of simplicity, let's consider that an address of an actor is, can be encoded in 10 bytes, okay? I'm conservative on this one. It can be eight, it can be 12, depending on the runtime. Let's consider it's 10 for the beauty of the math. So if we have 50,000 actors, uh, that want to be addressed on the map. So we need to store 50,000 records here. So it, the size of our map, 50,000 times 12, which is called ISIN here, plus 10 bytes, so it's around 1.1 megabyte. So our order, uh, our order actor here, it should store a map of 1.1 megabyte, which 
it, which is greater than the size of L2 cache memory. So it goes to the L3 cache. So the question, can we optimize this? Again, if we don't have uh, 50,000 order, it does not make sense. So we need to have a really uh, lot of actors processing. So the, the idea to optimize this is to be core aware. Instead of being actor aware, we can be core aware. So by core aware, it means that it's an opportunity to split our map into two maps. So the first map, we store the incoming key plus the core ID, and the core ID is actually the ID of the core, whatever it is, so it can be encoded in one byte. Uh, uh, the current machine, machines can be encoded in one byte. And then we have another map where we have the core ID, and we have a local router per, per core. It has an address. And this local router is responsible of sending the data to a destination actor. So we, don't, we only need its index per core. We don't need the full address of this one. We need its index. And it's this local router that knows the, uh, the map between the index and its, the current address of the actor. So we have more memory here. But by doing this technique, what do we gain? So we have the first uh, map. It's 12 byte. As I said, core ID is one byte. And we add another map, which one byte plus 10 bytes, address of local actor. And destination index can, can be encoded in one byte. So if we do the math, we are around 0 0.65 megabytes uh, instead of 1.1 megabytes. So this small optimization allowed us to gain 40% uh, cache memory. So that's it for the patterns. Now I will switch uh, to, to this uh, code. I'll let you read it. So people working in ultra low latency architecture, they, they, they know this type of code because uh, it's important. Uh, so what does this mean, actually? This means that we have the hardware guys that are complaining of the software guys why you are no, not doing your job, right? This is how I understand it. But uh, actually, it's two ecosystems and uh, two different uh, tools using two different disciplines using. In hardware engineering, I come from hardware engineering background, we are more into the engineering discipline, system engineering discipline. We, we, what we design is what we get. We don't have artistic uh, coding. What we design is what we get. In, in software industry, it's not the case yet. It's more, it's still artistic. We rely a lot on frameworks, middlewares, runtimes, languages, compilers, what you have to say, all, all these uh, uh, tools. And uh, we, we are getting farther and farther from the hardware, what actually is executing at the end, your, your code. And as you know, it, it, the, the idea here is to know actually how now we can uh, remove these layers, how we, or if we don't want to remove this layer because time to market, because the ease of development, we need at least a stack that we can control what we are doing. And we control really on, on, on how things currently execute uh, on multi-core. So if I want to put in perspective uh, uh, the way I see it, to, to go from software design to software engineering using system engineering principles. And as, as was said before in the previous talk, this was very interesting, that to go from a spaghetti code, pure spaghetti code, current, which is current multi-core software, to a ravioli code, there is a way, there is a pass to, to do it. And the pass, we should remember that at the end, we are, we are humans, we are, we are developers, we are different functions, and, and uh, each one is best at one type of um, uh, expertise. But at the end, the whole system is designed by several people, not by one person. If it's designed by one person, it's much easier. It's designed by several people. And we should have, from the beginning, a design that is concurrent. So we believe actor model is the best, uh, is the good uh, uh, abstraction for, for design. But then, when we want to develop actors, we should want to develop in the best way we developers are, are efficient at. We develop monothreaded, sequential. We are not good at multi-threading. It's impossible. 
uh, we cannot design a complex system more than seven parameters. So if you have more than seven threads, it cannot work. It's a human uh, barrier. It's called the Miller's law. So we should develop monothreaded. Sorry. And we should run parallel. So we design concurrent. We develop monothreaded. We run it in parallel using the framework of your choice. And at the end, we should execute reactive. So the framework, we should be sure that the stack we, we use, it is actually giving us reactive performance. And this part is, uh, on this idea, I conclude my, my talk. And uh, Simplex, our technology today is in C++, so uh, um, because uh, uh, it's in C++ for performance reasons and for se several reasons, but we have uh, also a Java, uh, J Java SDK, okay? Uh, you can contact me for, if you want more information about it. It's open source, it's on GitHub, Apache 2.0. If you have any use case, any projects, any, any ideas uh, on how we can use better or cohabit several frameworks uh, for the same purpose of, uh, of performance. I'm, I'm happy to talk with you guys uh, in this uh, meeting. And as I promised, I will give back this one. So it's, it's here. Thank you. Do you have any questions? You're hungry now. You saw the pasta. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so, um, sorry, your, your latencies are based on the actual compute itself. Um, what kind of latencies do you see if you include serialization and deserialization? Um, I think especially fix is somewhat bloated protocol uh, compared to binary protocols. So if you include the entire flow, I guess, in your demonstration, you, you didn't include serialization and deserialization of market data messages, for example? Is that I, I, I'm not hearing very well. You said virtualization? No, deserialization. Deserialization, okay, sorry. Uh, so the question is? Um, what, what kind of latencies do you see if you include deserialization and serialization on the other end, I guess? Ah, okay. Uh, so uh, in, in our case, uh, so the example I, I showed here, we don't have a, a deserialization uh, problem, okay? But we experience it a lot when we have multiple clusters communicating with each other. So when we want to send a message from one cluster to the other, then we are obliged to do deserialization and serialization. And in this case, it's very interesting because we use the right technique depending on the deployment. So if we have several clusters running on the same machine, we do shared memory communication. If they are on different machines, then we do, uh, we do for TCP IP or, or any type of protocol that is high performance, it depends on the use case. So, uh, but on, on one cluster, we don't have this problem because the messaging is completely in cache, in memory, and we don't depend on a, any third party to send the events between, between actors. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh. Right. Uh, great talk, thanks. Uh, I have one question. Is it, it looks like you're you're tied in pretty closely to the hardware. What hardware vendors do you support? Today uh, we are on Intel hardware, Xeon, Xeon Phi, and uh, with the new architecture of Skylake, uh, we we experienced a lot of uh, uh, performance drawbacks because they changed their their cache memory hierarchy. Uh, so, this type of drawbacks actually, uh, we, we solve them at simplex level, but they are not solved at the actor model level. For the, for the system level, they, he will keep the same code running. And in terms of uh, porting uh, the, uh, the runtime, the runtime is completely portable to any exotic uh, multi-core architecture, many-core architecture, and even embedded multi-core. Uh, we tried it on Raspberry Pi, it works perfectly. We, 
uh, it's completely portable. We don't depend uh, on, on any third parties. Mm. Great. Does it answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Cloud. Hi, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the patterns that you use is occasionally a direct call from one actor to a method on, for, of another actor on the same core. How does that differ from sending messages from one actor to another on the same core? Yeah, so actually, technically, it's, uh, it's another API. We don't push the message. Uh, we call directly, we have uh, the sender actor will have the reference of the other actor, and he can call directly the function that implements the event instead of pushing the message, putting it on the queue, and then be, be used by it. So, uh, so if I get to this example, I, I have a snapshot of code. So if you see here, it's actually it's not the same uh, mm -hmm. API as uh, pushing to the pipe. We are getting the reference of the green actor the actor reference, and then we call directly the, 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 the function of the green actor. So it, it, technically, it's the same. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not, um, how we say, portable to, to, to other core, but this optimization, uh, when we are core aware, we, we want to do it. We don't want to be overkilled by, mm. by this one.